We are here with ACC FI Presents. Today, my guest is Jeffrey Banks, American icon in the fashion industry. And um, I am just so, um, so happy to be able to welcome Jeffrey to our uh, our, our web show. We've, we've been running this for a few weeks now. Um, it's really been something really for the larger part of the summer um, and really introducing industry veterans and you know, industry icons uh, to our local industry here, um, but it's really been reaching so much further beyond this area. So, uh, Jeffrey, we are so glad to have you. Thank you so much for joining me. Thank you. I'm, I, I wish I could be there in reality, but I'm happy to be here virtually. Um, I'm here in Austin, so I have yet to come, but I'm very much looking forward when travel opens up to, to come and visit Austin in person. We would love to see you. We are really looking forward to it. Um, you know, uh, we were able to meet through a mutual friend, um, Ed Jones, um, Edward Jones III, um, yes. who has been um, an incredible uh, support here um, for us creating the Fashion Incubator. Um, mm -hmm. But he's like, you've got to talk to Jeffrey Banks. You just <laughs> got to talk to Jeffrey. <laughs> Tell me again, how did you and Ed meet again? Ed and I met because, um, well, first of all, we're both in the same industry. I mean, originally I started in the menswear industry, although I've done women's and, and I've done kids also. But Ed worked for um, Perry Ellis. He helped develop Perry Ellis's menswear division. Perry originally started as a women's wear designer and a, and a year or so into doing women's, he decided to, to, to branch out into men's and Ed came to run the business came from Texas uh, uh, to New York to run the business. And that's how we met. Perry and I were great friends. We met exactly at the beginning of both of our careers. I wow. went to Perry's very first show and every show after that. Um, and, you know, was a great cheerleader of, of his, his talent and, and as he was of mine. And then, of course, we, we, we've always remained friends and seen each other. Um, but when I, a few years ago, when I did the uh, book uh, bio of, of Perry, Ed was really instrumental in A, connecting me with a few people that I'd lost touch with. And he had also had a lot of archival um, photographs and stuff, which we ended up using in the book. And so he was very helpful in that way. Wow. Um, you know, um, Jeffrey, one of the things I really appreciate about you is that you're your work across this industry has really kind of spanned across all, all parts of the business. I mean, you're in publishing, you've been in education, you've been in, you know, you've been working as a designer yourself, doing incredible business, you know, but you've worked with so many of the greats, you know, can you really tell me how did you get your start in the fashion sure. industry? Sure. Well, as a child, I always loved to draw. Um, my mother says I could draw before I could walk. I I don't believe her, but that's what she says. And she said, I never drew stick figures. They were always recognizable forms. You know, that's a cat, that's a dog, that's a person, that's a house. Um, and um, my father uh, also drew um, really well too, but he became a cartographer. You know what cartography is? The art of map making. Um, so he did that for the government in Washington, D.C., where I grew up. Wow. And, uh, my mother, I always say, was the original clothes horse. My mother has exquisite taste. She's 99. She'll be 100 in, in, in January. Amazing. And she still wears high heels, and she still looks extraordinary. Oh. Um, and, um, and so I always say she was, you know, the original clothes horse. <laughs> and um, I think early on, I realized from a pretty young age that to be an artist and to be successful, and, and be able to make a living is really hard. But if you could take that artistry and turn it into clothing design, you had what I thought of as instant gratification. You know, if you design something and someone likes it and they buy it, you're gonna find out fairly quickly whether you're successful or you're not successful. Right. So by the time I was 10, I knew I wanted to be a fashion designer and I designed my mother's Easter outfit. Wow. And even though I didn't know how to sew, I sketched it. I went with my mother to her dressmaker. Um, and my mother sews beautifully, by the way, but she worked full time for the government. So she didn't have a lot of time to sew. But she had this wonderful dressmaker, Annie, who could make anything from a photograph, from a sketch. 
and you know this bossy little ten year old you know <laughs> went to the fittings you know picked out the fabric did no make the bus higher make the skirt shorter and. <laughs> You know, they listened to me, these two women who knew how to sew, listened to me, <laughs> tell them how to how to make this dress and matching coat. It was a, a banana wool jersey coat with wow. uh, with princess lines, with uh, asymmetric buttons, jet buttons. And wow. then uh, she had a banana raw silk dress underneath. I told my mother exactly what accessories to wear, what kind of hat, what kind of shoe, what kind of bag. <laughs> and we walked into church on Easter Sunday, and she got rave reviews, and the die was cast. That was it. There was no That's church amazing. from that from that point. And there was a store in Washington D.C. called Bridges of Georgetown, which was the most exclusive, most expensive men's store in Washington, founded by two men who were advertising um, had an advertising agency, and they bought all their clothes in New York because Washington was very staid very conservative in the in the in the sixties. Um, there wasn't a lot of fashion. So they all, people used to say, where do you get your clothes? And they would say, oh, New York, New York. So they decided they should open a store. So they opened the store in Washington. I started shopping there from the time I could wear men's clothing, you know, so about 13. Mm -hmm. And uh, much to my parents' dismay because it was the most expensive store in Washington. <laughs> and and um, I um I, I was in there one, one, one day after school, one Thursday after school uh, when I was 15, and uh, the assistant manager came over to me and he says, you know, I think you might be the youngest customer of shops here. How old are you, like 17, 18? I said, no, I'm 15. He said, 15? <laughs> and I said, yes. And he, he proceeded to tell me what he thought was a secret, that they were going to open a second store the following year. Mm -hmm. uh, on on Connecticut Avenue, close to the White House, and mm -hmm. I said, "Yeah, I know where you're going to open that store. It's the old Saks Pasternak Building." Blah blah blah. And he said, "How did you know that?" <laughs> I said, well, I read the industry newspaper DNR, and he said, "You read DNR?" And I said, "Yeah, I've had a subscription since I was 12." <laughs> so he said, "Would you like to come and work for us?" Absolutely. And he literally said that. That was the next thing out of his mouth, and I said. I would love it. And that Saturday, I started working, selling clothes, never having had a job in my life. That's and I great. I tell you, Nina, it's the most fun I ever had. That's I mean, amazing. it was just such a joy to wait on people, you know, to help these guys who couldn't put a shirt and tie together to save their life. And then the <laughs> following week, have their girlfriends or their wives come and say, I don't know what you did, just do it again. Because he's never listened to it. So, it was, you know, I never looked at it as work, and I and you know people always say that if 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 what you do is what you love, it's not work, and that's what it that's what it seemed like to me. And um, so anyway, the following year, um, the owners of the store told Ralph Lauren uh, that you got to meet this kid, you know, this sixteen year old kid. He knows all about you. He's a huge fan of what you do. Now, you have to remember, Ralph Lauren at that point had only been in business three or four years. Um, I knew instinctively he was going to be as big as he is now. I knew it. I felt Just it. And I believed in him. I wow. totally believed in him and his vision of, 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 of clothes. And Bridges was one of the first five stores in the whole country to carry his, his clothing. Wow. So he was coming down um, to do a charity fashion show, Valentine's Day, and um, I had perfect attendance, elementary school, junior high school, high school. And I told my parents, I'm not going to school tomorrow. <laughs> and you're going to write a note. <laughs> and they did. And they did. And I, I went to the store and I had just gotten my driver's license. And the owners of the store said, take the company station wagon and pick him up at the airport, which I did. You and, picked him up, Lauren, from the airport? I, I picked him up at the airport, wow. yes. And had a flat tire on the way. <laughs> <laughs> had a flat tire on the oh way. Got, got someone, flagged someone down to help change it, because I didn't know how to change a tire. Fortunately, <laughs> we had a spare in the back. Yeah, we, yeah. We, changed, we changed the tire. I, I, I got there. Of course, I'm a, I was like, you know, sweating bullets because now I'm late to the airport. Fortunately, his plane was late coming in oh, from New goodness. York. 
So uh, that that was okay. And we spent the entire weekend that he was in 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 Washington talking about Cary Grant and Audrey Hepburn and Fred Astaire and clothes and all the things that he loved and the things I loved. Wow. And he said, "What do you want to be when you grow up?" Basically, <laughs> he said, I want to be a designer like you. And he said, "Well, you know, when you when you come to look at colleges, you call me up. I might have a job for you." Well, that's all I needed to hear. Okay, that kept me going for the next year and a half. Yeah. <laughs> and um, just the thought that he might have a job for me, and so I came the next year at seventeen. Mm -hmm. uh, to look at colleges with my mother, and um, the day after we looked at schools, I went to 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 talk to Ralph. And two weeks later, he said, "You've got a you've got the job." So three weeks out of high school, two months before I started college, I was working for for Ralph Lauren as his second assistant, only the second assistant he had. So it was great, uh -huh. and we still we have a we continue to have a great relationship. Um, we're still great friends. Um, he invited me to his 50th anniversary gala fashion show and dinner. Had me sit at the head of my table. I mean, it was it was it was lovely. It's lovely. He always called me his other son, which is which is really really great. That's amazing. I love the bond that's created over just the passion of mm -hmm. you know the industry and creating product that is you know stylish and you know and compelling and connects with the customer. I mean, you've just I love your stories, first of all, Jeffrey. I'm just like, this is amazing. Like, you really just connected with so many amazing people. You know, well, um, one of the things that I was really, um, you know, just as I'm kind of shifting into some of your your written works, um, mm -hmm. because you've written, so, you know, you, you have several um, titles out. You know, you've got yeah. the Perry Ellis book, you've got Tartan, you've got, mm -hmm. I mean, there's, there are several others, but Norel is the, is the newest one, right? It's the newest book, yeah. Okay. Norel about... was the book that I wanted to, to make my second book. Um, uh, the first book I did was Tartan Romancing the Plaid. Since, since I was a little kid, I've always been obsessed with Scottish Tartan Plaid. Now, Ask me why a black kid from Washington is obsessed <laughs> with Scott Scotland's national fabric. I, you know, I, 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 I wanted to know why. I couldn't figure out why. Why was I so obsessed with it? And then, as I started to explore it, I saw that other people were obsessed with it. I mean, when you go to Korea, they love tartan plaid. When you go to Japan, you know, when you go to Milan, every well-dressed Milanese doctor, lawyer, architect. They have a tartan line raincoat or tartan scar, and they're not Scottish. So, right. and every book I ever read about tartan, none of it, it was basically how to find your family's clan. It, it, it really, they were all the same. And I've got 60 books and they're all basically identical, but none of them really got to the heart of why all of us in the world are entranced by tartan. Mm -hmm. um, and so, I said, I'm going to write a book about it. Now, I didn't know the first thing about writing a book. In fact, I went to Barnes & Noble. I bought a paperback book called How to Write a Book. <laughs> you know, you know, I love that. Table of contents and you I might need to borrow that book. Marketing <laughs> plan and, uh, you know, all of that kind of stuff. I, I followed it, you know, I followed it religiously. It took me five years to, to do the book. But it's a serious, it's a coffee table book. It's 288 pages. It yeah. weighs six and a half pounds. Oh, it's incredible work. Book, the gorgeous pictures, but it also has a lot of text and a lot of story, the history of Tartan, where it comes from. And we talk to theologians, we talk to psychiatrists, we talk to architects, we talk to composers, we talk to lots of people to get their feeling about why, why Tartan is important and why we relate to it. So, mm -hmm. um, so that was the first book. Uh, I when I finished it, I said, I'll never do another book because <laughs> it was the hardest thing I've ever done. But it was <laughs> successful right away. And it's still in print. It came mm -hmm. out in 2007 and it's still very much in print, it's still in demand all over the world, which is really the shocking thing for me. And I wanted my second book to be about Norman Norell. Norman Norell is a great American designer. He was born in 1900 in no Noblesville, uh, Indiana. He was born Norman Levinson, Norman David Levinson. His father was Jewish. His mother was Methodist. Um, and he came at 20 years of age. He came to New York 
um, to uh, study at Pratt and, and, and Parsons School of Design to study design. And he ended up uh, designing for movies. Now, in the 1920s, all of the movie studios were in New York, uh, in Astoria, Queens, uh, Paramount, and so forth. And so on. They, they were all in New York. And he designed at 21 years of age, he designed for Rudolph Valentino um, in a silent movie called The Sainted Devil. Yeah, at 23 years of age, he designed for Gloria Swanson in a movie called Zaza, which was later remade as a talkie. And then in 1925, the studios moved to California. And he didn't want to go to California. He wanted to stay in New York. Mm -hmm. So he ended up going to work for a woman named Hattie Carnegie, who had a ready-to-wear concern and a store uh, just off of Fifth Avenue, you know, for Park Avenue ladies. Um, when she she was an immigrant from Poland, when she got to Ellis Island, uh, the, the the customs people said, what, what's your name? And she said, who's the richest man in America? And they said, Andrew Carnegie. And she said, that's my last name. So she was <laughs> a, a total invention herself. And uh, Norman decided that he needed a, a more glamorous last name. So he took the Nor from Norman the L from Levinson, and he added, as he said, an extra L for luck. So he became uh, Norrell, Norman Norrell. Wow. Now, the, the interesting thing I did when I started doing the research was I found out he never changed his name legally. It was, you know, Norman David Levinson, a.k.a. Norman Norrell. Wow. Um, but he became very quickly the most famous American designer, starting in the 1930s. Mm -hmm. on his own, um, and then going right through to 1972 and his death at 72 years of age. Wow. He, he, he dressed Dinah Shore and Lena Horne and Lauren Bacall and uh, Doris Day and Jacqueline mm -hmm. Kennedy and Marilyn Monroe. I mean, oh, yes. just <laughs> all these incredible people, you know, as well as lots and lots of regular customers. And the thing about Norell's clothes, which even as a kid drew me to him and why I wanted to do this book about him was the clothes were made beautifully. He really understood Paris couture techniques, which he did in ready to wear. His clothes were ready to wear. You had to go to a store to buy them. He didn't make custom clothes. Even if you were Marilyn Monroe and you ordered a dress in a different color or a different length, he would make it for you, but you had to pay a store. He had it shipped through one of his stores because he said his stores had been loyal to him from day one. So he was not going to have you in run the stores by trying to go up wholesale, as it were. Oh, so, wow. Yeah, you know, all, all of his customers had to, they got an invoice from a store, whether it was Bergdorf's or Bonwitz or whatever. And, um, his his clothes had a beautiful everything had silk linings all the fabrics came from europe um his buttons were especially made for him if he did white collars and cuffs on a dress they were made in switzerland in linen by nuns and then they, they flew the collars and cuffs over to be attached to the dress and they had you know they had uh buttons or snaps that you could remove them to launder them so that they would be you know crisp clean white Mm -hmm. um, he was probably best known for his sequin dresses, um, which were uh, had the nickname mermaid dresses. His mermaid yes. dresses they fit like a second skin, mm -hmm. and they were usually made out of either chiffon or or silk jersey. Mm -hmm. Every sequin was sewn on by hand. Amazing, and sewn on in such a way that they were not stitched in the same place. Each sequin was stitched in a different area so that they undulated and moved with the body. And, and, and I mean, they were gorgeous. That's and true artistry. Those dresses, whether they were sequin dresses in the 1930s, 40s, 50s, 60s, or 70s, if you can find them, which is not easy, but if you can find them, they look brand new. They look as gorgeous. You know, a dress from the 1940s looks, you know, absolutely exactly. beautiful. And that's why it's so hard to find because women, won't give them up. They just oh, right. wear them over and over again. And you know, and when you do find them, they're they're they're, they're thousands of dollars. Um, mm -hmm. you know, in 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 vintage stores. I mean, uh, 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 
Kristen Davis, who played in Sex and the City. She yeah. wore a vintage Norel to the opening of the Sex and the City movie in London. Wow. Um, Mrs. Obama wore vintage Norel um, in 2010 at a Christmas Christmas party at the White House. She's mm -hmm. only the first first lady to ever wear vintage to to you know while she was in the White House. That's incredible. Um, so anyway, uh, I, I wanted to do a book about you because part of the reason I wanted to go to Parsons School of Design, which I did transfer to mm -hmm. from Pratt, was because Norell was a critic. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, the year that I that I uh, transferred was the year that he died. But mm -hmm. I did get to meet him about a month before he died. Wow. Um, he, was, he was doing a trunk show at Bonwood Teller, and I ran over, and I was sort of hiding behind columns just to see what this you know, revered man looked like. Mm -hmm. And one of his models, Pat Maury, saw me and mm -hmm. she came over and she said, would you like to meet Mr. Norell? And I said, yes, she could tell I was a student and she mm -hmm. brought me over to meet him. He was very shy, I was very shy, but I did get to meet him. And That's the interesting thing was when I was doing the research for the book at the New York Times, uh, I found a photograph that was taken about 15 minutes before I met him. Of Oh my God. Uh, Narelle with those two models on the floor at Baumwitz. They wow. had been published in the time. So it was like kind of full circle. I love that. I, got, I kind of got chills when you said that. You're like 15 minutes before you you found an image. That's so cool. Yeah. yeah. In the New York Times. Yeah. yeah. And and uh, the, the other really lovely thing, and one of the things that, you know, really intrigues me about doing books is, is doing the research, as I call it, CSI fashion. Yeah, you know, yes, like yes. finding out all these things, <laughs> connecting the dots, and mm -hmm. there was a guy who worked for Norell who uh, who 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 ran his sales for a period of twelve years. His name was uh, 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 Max, and 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 uh, Max Bernegger. He was a salesman at a um, embroidery house in Switzerland that still exists. Makes a lot of the embroidery for Chanel and so forth. And Narelle mm -hmm. was doing business with him because he bought all his fabrics in Europe. And one day he was there shortly after Narelle took over owning his company outright. And he was complaining to this 27 year old kid that he couldn't find anyone to run his company and that it was so hard being the designer and being the business person. Mm -hmm. And Max said, well, why don't you give me a shot? And Narelle said, okay, I'll give you a shot. And Max came over in the first year he made Narelle financially solvent, and he would put him a, a million dollars in the black. Wow. You know how good he was. Wow. So as I was working on the book and reading, you know, finding out a little bit about Max, I was like, gee, I wonder if this guy is still alive. And I did my Google search, and yeah, yeah. the only thing I could come up with was Max Bernegger, oil exec retired oil executive mm -hmm. living in Florida. And I said, I'm going to give it a shot. And I got the phone number and I called and I said, uh, I may I speak to Max Bernegger? And yeah, this is Max. And I said, um, did you ever work for Norman Norell? And he said, yes, I did. And we started this conversation. We were on the phone like six hours. Wow. It was unbelievable. <laughs> he was just, he and his wife, uh, Norell was God, godfather to their children. Um, he um, he had saved all these wonderful photographs, personal photographs of Norell, which of course I was able to include in the book. That's and the best, the best thing ever about doing this book was when I got the first copy, I FedExed to, to Max and his, his wife Loretta in Florida. And I said, I, I want you to see the very first copy of the book. And they were on two different phone lines and they got, got on the phone. And they said, you brought Norman back to life. You brought Norman back to life. Now, mm -hmm. you know what? It doesn't get any better than that. I mean, it the fact doesn't. that he trusted me with doing that and thought that I could do it and then said, I accomplished what I set out to do. That's that incredible. That, that's Beautiful. the most incredible compliment you could get for uh -huh. the body of work and the, the research and the attention to detail in telling someone's story. Yeah. Yeah, almost almost 35, 40 years after Norell died, you wow. know. Um, but I, I felt it was my sacred duty to do it because I don't want 
what he did to be lost. You know, right, right. Uh, I think that's kind of what drives me with all the books that I've done is is to I've always loved history, I always loved history, you know, in school. And I think it's I don't think that we can go forward in any way, shape or form, not just in the fashion business, but in any way, shape or form without knowing the history where we've come from. You know, I mean, my parents, my parents were at the March on Washington. I remember it vividly as a as a 10 year old boy, you know, and how afraid they were to take my sister and I to that march. And they didn't because they were afraid there would be violence, you know, and and and, and look where we are now. You know, so history is always an important part of, I think, everything we do or should be. Absolutely. I, you know. Honestly, I just feel so inspired, you know, by, you know, your living out of your purpose. You know, I think that, you know, everyone is uniquely crafted to bring certain things to light and to um, to connect the dots and to keep the story alive. And thank you. Thank you for <laughs> embracing that and for wow. helping us to understand more about, you know, really as fashion industry, you know, where we come from and what we've built on and where we, you know, where it's going, you know, but you're right, we need that history, that anchor, you know, yeah. to really, you know, becomes I mean, here. Just to tell you an, uh, another quick story, Willie Smith, mm, the designer yes. Willie Smith was a good friend of mine. And, uh, and in fact, I was planning to have dinner with him the week, the week we, we had scheduled it and he died like the week before we were supposed to do it. Um, and um, a couple of years ago, the Cooper Hewitt Museum uh, informed me that they were planning to do a retrospective show of Willie. Mm -hmm. And I said, that's a fantastic idea. I said, you should definitely do that. It's long overdue to have a show done about him. And I said, if there's any way I can help you, you know, let me know. And um, they said, you know, we're looking for video of his fashion shows. And it was the very, er, when Willie Will started, it was the very beginning of doing uh, video for, 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 for shows. And I knew exactly who to call, who could find the videos. And I found for their exhibition, I found you know, all these videos for them. And then I said to them, are you doing a book? Um, Cause you really should do a book to go along with the show. They said, we were thinking of doing a book. I said, well, let me connect you with my publisher Rizzoli because I think and sure enough, there is there is now a book, and thank goodness there is because the exhibition was supposed to open Friday the thirteenth wow. of 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 March, the day everything shut down. Wow! So thank yeah. God there's a book. I mean, hopefully when the museum opens, they will have wow. they canceled the exhibition or they canceled the opening. I'm wow. sure the, the exhibition is still installed, but of course museums are are, are still closed in New York. Right. So. Right. But th but there is a book, you know, and you can you can you can read about him and see, you know. Mm -hmm. So I I I've always felt that I've been incredibly lucky in that I got to do what I've always wanted to do, which was to work in the fashion industry and be a designer and make a living out of it and yeah, travel yeah. the world and go to see the Taj Mahal and Paris and London and all these places, you know that my parents dreamed about, but didn't get a chance to do, um, you know, until until later in life. So, right. Right. so I feel it's a responsibility to give back. And if giving back means lecturing to, to kids in school, if it means writing these books, so this history is preserved, I, I think that's so important. I think that's really a key thing. Well, we're so fortunate and we're so lucky to have you do that. I mean, you've been an incredible designer in your own right, you know, 20 million in sales globally. I mean, you, you've Jeffrey Banks Limited, you know, an incredible brand, you know, on your own. Uh, uh, the, the, the Morona line that I did in the, in the 80s, we were $150 million a year. Oh my goodness. When, I started, when I started Morona, it was a $7 million a year business. And wow. within six months, it was 70 million. And by the wow. end, it was $150 million a year. That's incredible, Jeffrey. I, you know, honestly, like, you know, um, as a black woman, you know, I, you know, it's so powerful to see other um, black people in our industry, you know, really making incredible business. And I know that, you know, kind of in the scope of what's been going on, you know, culturally, you know, um, I think there's been, you know, more attention to, 
elevating voices in the Black community. Um, but as much as you are an icon of American history, you're also an icon of Black history, you know, and not his, you know, but, but continually making incredible, you know, um, impact in, in our world and what we see. You know, I think no, being able to know that you're like, oh, I, I've done that already. I know how to build business. I've already created that. You know, now I'm doing, you know, it's, I wow. have to tell you, it's personally very, very inspiring to know that you have, you know, you are, it's, it's current, it's now, it's, you well, know, ever evolving. It's, it's interesting that you say that, Nina, because I'm working on a new project, which I can't really talk about okay. right at this moment. We'll, we'll, we'll have to have a second chat. I would love to do another chat. chat. We'll have to talk yeah, about We'll have to have a second chat. chat. But what I will tell you is that right now, on everyone's mind, whether they like it or they don't like it, is the subject of Black Lives Matter, is the su subject of gender equality, mm -hmm. is the subject of racial inequity. I mean, everyone is talking about it. And everyone is saying, what can I do? What should I say? I don't want to say the wrong thing. I don't want to do the wrong thing. I mean, you can't get away from it, you know, unless you're uh, hiding under a rock. Right. And so I'm working on this project that is going to take all of that, all of that verbiage and turn it into apparel. And it's, I, I'm so excited about it. I can't get to yeah. talk. Okay. <laughs> that is the teaser. Art. It's going to involve apparel. And I think it's going to, in a very interesting way, it's going to, it's going to make people talk even more about it and open up worlds of dialogue. And it's and it's not even just going to be apparel. It's going to be furnishing, home furnishings. It's going to be lots of different things. That's so excellent. We'll come back. Well, because that, we that'll be a whole different will. discussion. We have to. Okay, Jeffrey, um, I can't believe our 30 minutes is already up. This time just flies by. And um, I just have to say thank you so much for joining me. Um, you know, you. You, are, thank you, you, are, you. You you're seriously a living legend. I mean, you are you you are iconic. You've you know really shaped the industry that we're a part of. And so, thank you so much uh, for joining me. It is genuinely an honor uh, to get a chance to speak with you today. Thank you. Well, it was an honor to speak with you. I enjoyed every moment of it, and I look forward to meeting you and speaking with you in person very soon. Thank you, so do I. Um, so guys, we're gonna wrap up here. This has been ACCFI Presents with Jeffrey Banks um, talking about the book Norel um, and his illustrious career in the fashion industry. Uh, we can always keep up with you on our social media handles at ACC Fashion Incubator on LinkedIn, Instagram, and our uh, Facebook and Twitter pages, as well as our email list at fashion.incubator at austincc. Edu. So feel free to reach out to us there. Um, we'll be giving you updates on all of our programming at the college, um, as well as what's going on with the Fashion Incubator specifically. So um, again, thank you so much for joining us today. And that is ACCFI Presents.